time for everybody. We don't uh, tend to work in the, the same team, but it's really nice to be connected with you today to hear about what you've been doing to keep yourself well during this, you know, strange and challenging time for people. Um, so I think I've coped with it well, largely because I'm used to it, but it has thrown up issues that uh, I didn't anticipate I, I would really experience. Right, okay. So because you were familiar with the mechanics of home working already, which yeah. a lot of people have had to adjust to quite quickly, you felt yeah. that that would probably sort of stand you in good stead. But even with that, it's having that uh, opportunity to, to manage your own uh, work, how you do that, how you interact with people, that's proved more challenging for now. Yes, it has. Um, and, you, you know, you, you can't have informal conversations so much now because most of us are now relying on some form of um, electronic medium to, to, to communicate. So, for example, I'm now struggling to get to groups with Zoom. Um, not, not very successfully at the moment, but and I find that things are much more have to be much more structured. So I, it sounds strange, but I've actually stopped using the phone less. Uh, I've started using the phone less and relying more on video, which, which is in a sense more clunky in a way, <laughs> um, and it requires you to be more disciplined. Yes. So those informal sort of day to day interactions that I guess we took for granted when we stopped by yeah. somebody's desk, chat with them, how they're doing. And then they would also maybe notice if you had been struggling for some reason, it's more obvious maybe to see when you're standing next to that person. So yeah. I guess there's been more reliance on people checking out their own signs and symptoms. You know, what is it that makes them realise maybe they're not as well as they could be? And for you yourself, Amit, what would you say uh, are the signs that maybe you need a bit of extra help at times? I think one of the issues uh, with being in relative isolation is that our minds don't switch off. Mm. So you start to think about usually bad things. <laughs> People don't normally think about great things, you know, I'm going to go and have a swim today or something like that. You start to think of the more negative things because your overall context, especially if you watch a lot of television, as I do, television news and so on, is uniformly bleak. So all sorts of irrational fears come into your mind, which normally you would probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't entertain. Yeah, definitely. So fears and anxieties seem to, to grow on each other. And it's interesting that when you did become aware of that anxiety, that you reached out to a colleague to seek some reassurance. And that was yeah. given to you um, at that time. So have you uh, done that with other people? Have you done that with uh, on other situations, reaching out to people? The one area that I've changed markedly is that I now have weekly conversations with some of my former ACAS colleagues. Now, these are people I only see maybe a couple of times a year. Um, but I don't know how this developed, but we now talk every week. Um, and I think uh, it helps to sort of interact with someone who's away from the organization, although they're former colleagues. Um, and that gives you a sort of, I don't know, a point of contact, I suppose, a contact outside of your normal. Uh, interactions with my wife, with a limited number of colleagues and so on. And I think that's been very useful to me uh, to see their take on the world because they're, they're, they're talking from this perspective of retired pensioners now and, and how do they see it. But just to have that interaction I think is beneficial, for, certainly beneficial for me. Yes, yes. So there is something really about having as many different types of communication or communicating with as many different people, because when we have fears and you've mentioned the word irrational, yeah, these can get out of control and we can start to spiral and one builds on the next. But when you talk to people, there's a way of sort of bringing that back down and either normalising it because you recognise that other people are feeling and thinking the same things, or maybe people can sort of help you think about it in a bit more of a you know rational way or take it down down a layer. So, so in terms of a more practical support from the organization that you work for, that your colleagues work, or you know, the people you know work for, what do you would you say may be helpful them to find out from their line manager when they're feeling like this? What sort of conversations would be helpful? So I think the secret I would say, uh, and I, I understand that this would vary from one person to another, is to 
have informal conversations as normally as you normally would. Uh, and I think, and the other thing I would say is have them frequently. Mm -hmm. I think the worst thing is to, to do is just sit there week after week feeling miserable. And then when, <laughs> when you're really feeling down, suddenly to phone a colleague and or your boss or whoever it might be, and and share those views then. And I think the, the real secret is to keep in relatively regular touch because that's that's the key, I think, to maintaining a degree of normality rather than let things just drift. Yeah, yeah, and that is absolutely spot on. I mean, it's essentially about having those sort of organic conversations where things about mental health and well-being and what you're doing to keep yourself well and what's concerning you just come out naturally in those interactions so the more you have the more likely to you're to have those conversations and to get in early as you said before it starts to uh, start to seem really difficult actually and then it's much harder to uh, voice those concerns when they've started to sort of grow in your mind that's right and in terms of people who maybe are less uh, confident or less articulate or less able to ask um, those questions of their manager. Is there any advice that you would give to somebody who maybe is new to the workplace or uh, less confident to be able to have, have those conversations? I think the first thing I would say to anyone who is, as you say, relatively new to the workplace or maybe is not used to working from home, for example, which many of us aren't, yeah. let's be honest, um, is first of all, get some structure in your day. Um, when I first started working from home all those years ago, I had no structure. But nowadays, I know my routine. I go into the, to the uh, kitchen, I make my breakfast, come to this room, log on, and I sit there for a couple of hours or whatever it is until my wife gets up, and then we have a cup of tea or something. Know what you're going to do during the course of the day. I won't say that I necessarily replicate a working day, uh, but the structure that you give for yourself, I think, helps you to have some sort of order on how you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, why you're going to do it. I think that's the first thing I would say to anyone who, who for whom this experience is relatively new. And the other thing I would say is that it is good to be able to speak to your line manager, let's say. But you also have to recognize that line managers may not necessarily be the best person always in a particular situation. Are there friends in whom you can trust to confide in or colleagues? Um, use the available resources that you have. I mean, I take another example. Um, I talk to my son pretty much every day, even though he's overseas at the moment. My advice would be think of who you are comfortable with. Mm. Um, and uh, try and bring those people into your sort of environment, into your sort of electronic world and, and engage with them to the extent that you want and to the extent that you need. And the other thing I would say is you might be able to help them. I mean, yes. it's, not, it's, not always two way, it's not always one way thing. They may, you may be able to help them. So I had a conversation with someone, um, a colleague, in fact, uh, last week, and and that colleague expressed some, uh, I don't know, um, feelings about maybe not being feeling great about being in, in the home. If that kind of situation emerges, I think you'd be doing everyone a favor by maybe offering your, your sort of yourself as a, as a kind of a sounding board or someone to just talk to, even if it's for 10 minutes. So the whole range of things you could do uh, to help yourself, and indeed, don't forget, maybe to help others as well. Yeah, absolutely. So really, again, these whole different strands of communication, uh, different routes to getting help and support, but actually giving that help and support back without even realizing it. And I guess there are sometimes practical things that you'll need from your manager. So if it's a workplace issue, maybe you've got technology issues or maybe your workloads change. So having those conversations with your manager, but equally thinking about those different uh, places that you can just have a quick chat with somebody. Mm. And I just want to, as, as a sort of final question, you mentioned about um, 
going for a swim. So that's obviously a thing that's a positive thing to do for well-being, but it's restricted at the moment. And then you talked about something that maybe can challenge your well-being. So maybe listening to lots of news. And as you said, there's not much good news coming out there. So have you got any tips that, for things that have either helped yourself or tips for other people on what they can do to keep themselves well and managing during this time? Stay active. I know it sounds dark when you're, when you're stuck in a small house or a small flat, but if you can stay active, and I know the scope for that is, is, is restricted, uh, I think that helps. Uh, even if it is going for a half an hour walk, clear, clear your mind clear your head and get into a different environment, even if it's for a, a relatively short period of time. I mean, if you sit watching the television news for several hours a day, that's probably not, not a good thing to do. So break up your day. I said structure, yeah, but included in that structure should be things that break up your day, things that you like to do. I mean, I know a lot of people have been uh, um, watching DVDs and all of that. But I, I think variety is, is the issue. I mean, I'm trying to learn Spanish, so I, I'm, I'm now trying to pay a bit more attention to that th than I've done in the last couple of months. I try and do my Spanish lessons every day, even if it's only for 15 minutes. So I, I, my advice would break up your day, leave your normal environment as much as you can and as practicable. And that way, I think you, you kind of keep yourself mentally and to some extent, physically uh, fresh. Absolutely. So that uh, those are brilliant final tips, actually. And I think if you add in those the other things you've talked about, about communication, a variety of communication, picking up the phone as well and Skyping, having that structure to your day and balancing. But I think the point that you made earlier, just to enhance that, because that was really, really crucial, is about not uh, fixing that. So not having, if you don't do that at that time, uh, it's such a big deal. So being kind to yourself, realising your own expectations, realising your own boundaries between what's work and what's not work and not setting too rigid a, a schedule around that. Sure. And I think being kind is absolutely crucial to ourselves and to others at the moment. So I'm really, okay. really glad to hear from you today, Amir. I think you've really uh, given some great tips for our uh, colleagues and employers and employees who are listening to this. Thank you very My much. Good talking to you, Abigail. Thanks a lot. Bye.